Good morning, guys. How's everyone doing? Good morning. morning. Everyone doing good? Is it, is it still like freezing outside? Or is it warmed up? It's warmed up? Okay, good. Did anyone get out this morning and have to scrape off your windshield? Because I did. It was horrible. It's like I'm one of those people, it's like I can't wait for winter during the summer. And then it gets here and I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. Let's get summer back. And so you, you know how it goes, like first thing in the morning, first like frost of the year, you'd have no idea where your ice scraper is. I'm out there with a credit card. I'm actually on Dave Ramsey, so I'm out there with a debit card, you know, scraping it all. It, it was, okay, it was, I wanted to lament with you guys, but you guys overslept it, I think. Okay. <laughs> well, don't, don't get up so early. It's, it's horrible. All right. Anyway, how's everyone? Did everyone have a good fall break? Yeah? All, all the kids have a good fall break? Okay, cool. We we had a uh, we had a, a pretty good fall break. We um, so to, to catch you up on what's going on in my life. By the way, hi, I'm Jeff. I'm the youth pastor here. Um, all right. Now, here, so here's what we're working on right now. We we some of you. I realized this at last. I can't believe. All right, I'm stuttering because I wasn't prepared for this. Uh, we're pregnant. Jessica more so than me, but uh, but we co- conglomerately is, are pregnant. And um, yeah. So so what I'm having to do right now is I'm giving up my office. Um, to, to house a small child. And, and so what I'm being doing is I'm being kicked out of the house and moved to the garage. So a lot of my fall break was trying to prepare for this transition and, and essentially clean up the garage. I did not make it very far. Uh, so that's what a lot of my fall break was. But the one interesting thing that happened was we went, we went to the zoo. How many people have been to the Knoxville Zoo? Okay. All right, quite a bit. Okay, good. A lot of us in here. So we went to the Knoxville Zoo, and while we were there, uh, we climbed in that booth that, you know, it takes like your life savings, and they take a blurry picture of you. And you know the one I'm talking about. So uh, we went in, and we were taking the picture, and we realized that we actually have taken Lun into the zoo every year of her life. That this was her third trip. She's three years old, and we've been every year. Actually, I just had the memory pop up this morning on Facebook that we had taken her when she was like 10 months old. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. Um, so we were in there, and, and we, we took our picture. But this year, I think, was even better than the rest of the times we went, because she was older, and she got to, to see more things. Um, and... So she was more excited about the things we did see. Like we got to go and see the monkeys, and they, the monkeys are awesome. They just love to swing around and have a good time. Uh, we got to see the elephants and the, the rhinos, and we got to see the lions. Like this is one of those unique times of the zoo where we got to see every animal, right? That's amazing because like the zoo animals, they're, they're kind of like, they're spoiled a little bit. Like the lion gets too hot and he goes inside. Like they don't do that in the wild. It's like you tough it out, right? It goes in like it's a manicure or something. So anyway, we got to go, and that was me lamenting again. Um, so we got to go, and we got to see all of the animals, and it, we had such a good time. Um, and we went to see the tigers. Who's been to the tiger exhibit? It's, it, they just, yeah, they just recently redid it. So the way it is now is like you walk into this room, and it's like air-conditioned, so you just want to spend all day in there. And except this morning, you would want to be in the heat this morning. Um, so you get to go in this, like, this little room, and there's like a little mini-museum. They have a bunch of information, and they have these giant, I'm, I'm assuming, reinforced windows um, where you can see the, the tiger. And Jessica, can you put up the, the picture of uh, not my daughter? Okay, so I'll admit, in first service, I mistakenly said that the child with the, the bow is my daughter. Tis not, it is not. But this will give you a good picture of uh, me taking a picture of someone else's kids, I guess. But okay, this is where we were staring, standing. Um, and, and we had London kind of go up to the glass, and, and the, the tiger came just like it is here. And we were amazed. Like, we, you never get to see a tiger that close. And we're like, oh, this is awesome. This is so cool. We, we, we failed to think about how terrifying this might be for a two-foot-tall human, right? We failed to think about how terrifying it might be for a three-year-old that's about this tall, and the tiger's like right here. We were just admiring the tiger. <laughs> but, like, Lennon freaks out just a little bit. Um, also, not London, but you can visualize what it was like. London, like, turns around. I didn't realize that she was scared until she turns around and grabs my leg and, like, full force clinches on. Like, she's trying to hold on during a hur- hurricane or something. Like, she's just full force holding on and, like, screaming daddy. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is a problem. And, and so I-, I pick her up and I start my parenting process. I'm like, she's, the, the tiger's over there. There's a-, there's a glass barrier. The tiger's not even a real tiger. It's like a pansy zoo tiger. Like, you don't have to, you know, I'm like, I'm trying to, trying to reassure her here. And I'm trying to like, I'm trying to like, you know, parent here. And isn't it weird when God speaks to you in the strangest places? 
Like, like God's trying to like speak to me right now. I'm like, one second, I'm talking to my child. And he's like, I'm talking to my child. And I'm like, all right, I got my attention. And, and in that moment, I, I just felt like God was saying to me, why don't you act like that? When you're scared and life gets tough, why don't you turn around and cling to your father? Ooh, ooh. And I'm just like, wait a minute, I'm still correcting. He's like, me too. Me too. Sometimes God just speaks in the, in the weirdest moments at the weirdest times. But it's those times you've got to listen to. And that's sort of what inspired this message is, is I think, it, it, I know, at some point in our lives, most of us, when we were children, small children, we had this natural instinct that when we were scared or when we were afraid or something became too much or we fell off our bicycle or, or we got hurt, what did we do? We ran to our parental figure, this mom, dad, grandparent, uncle. We ran to someone who we thought could protect us, who could take care of us, could watch over us. You see, the problem came whenever, I'm assuming, I'm a youth pastor, so I'm assuming it's right around the preteen age, uh, that we suddenly thought we could do everything ourselves. And, and we, we suddenly think that, that, you, that you can't help me, right? You, you don't need to help me. I don't need your help. I can do it by myself. And the problem is, is this, this goes, on into, goes on with us into adulthood until we convince ourselves we now have to do everything ourselves. That we have to handle everything we experience, everything we're going through, every test, every problem, we have to handle it ourselves. You see, and, and God brought into to my memory that, uh, at that time, uh, the small portion, because I'm horrible with memory verses, but uh, Matthew 18, uh, verse 2 through 4, I'm going to read it for you, because I'll butcher it if I try to quote it from memory. It says, Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like, this little ch- like, these little, like little children, that's what it says, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And in that moment, I felt like God told me, this is what I mean. That when you are stirred and when you are afraid, that you turn and you put your faith in your Father in heaven, that you cling to him and you cry out, Daddy, Daddy. Right, that we would turn and, and put our faith. And, and the problem is, I find this to be a, a test of pride more than anything else. Because as adults, as young adults, as grown adults, mature human beings, we enter into this phase where we think everything is our responsibility. And we have to handle it. And it is a sign of weakness if we must ask for help. I'll give you a prime example of this. I'll use myself uh, uh, because I have a lot of great stories about myself. Um, <laughs> most of them are fairly demeaning, but okay. <laughs> so last year, after Christmas, I came and I, I preached a sermon, and I told you guys about how I built Jessica a bed um, for Christmas, and I felt really good about myself. It was a, a platform bed, solid wood. I was really manly. I pulled out the power tools, had to buy most of them because I didn't have them, but <laughs> so it was really Christmas for me. But okay, I, I built her a bed. And I was like, I felt really good about myself. I was like, you know, I'm not normally like the manliest. Don't let the beard fool you. I'm not like the manliest guy you'll meet. Um, But at that time, I felt pretty good. I built this with my hands. And and then I reached a point where I was in over my head. Because the problem came is the day before Christmas Eve where I had planned to give her the bed. Um, And it was in my garage. It didn't need to be in my garage. It needed to be in my bedroom. Now, just so you know, this is a seven-foot headboard. It's about five foot tall, solid wood, two by sixes. I didn't weigh it, but I'm betting it's around like 300 pounds. It's quite heavy. I'm now at the situation where I've got to put this into there. I've got to take it upstairs. I've got to take it around a corner, across a carpeted floor, and place it into place where it will stay forever because I'm not moving it again, just, just so you know. So what do I do? I move it. Not easily. No, no. I actually recorded the whole process because we were vlogging at the time. And uh, I recorded, it was, it was a, you, don't, uh, you would love to watch it because it would be very entertaining for you. I don't want to show it because I'm too prideful. And, um, but it was, it was a mess trying to move that thing. Like, I would scoot it like two feet, I'd stop, take a break, drink half a cup of water, and then, then start again. Like, it was, it was a nightmare. I lifted it up steps, I took it all the way. And anyway, I came and told that story in a sermon, and then uh, I walked out the doors, and, and a lot of people came up to me, several people. More, I was surprised by how many people came up, and they're like, dude, you're an idiot. They didn't say that, that's what they meant. Um, they, they, they came up and they said, why didn't you call me? I would have loved to have come and helped you move that. And I'm like, well, I just thought maybe you're kind of busy and, you know, you had other stuff. It was Christmas. And 
But if I'm honest with you, it was pride. I was responsible for it. I built it. I can move it. Right? It was dumb. It was so dumb. I about squashed myself like 13 times. <laughs> like, but I did it because it was pride. And if you, most of you guys are probably smarter than that. You're going to call and ask for help and not like throw out your back or something. I get it. I, I should have. I should have. But if we're all honest with ourselves and we really think about it, there's something in your life that you're trying to manhandle all on your own. In reality, you should be asking for help. And the thing is, when we take that all on ourselves, we put the weight of the world on ourselves, we are now entering into the building blocks of stress, anxiety, and burnout. We are. And that is what is crippling our nation by the day. And the problem is, we even do this with God. Like, every night, we we pray with London every single night, and I, I, I pray that she keeps this habit up as she grows older. But every night we pray with her. And, and you should know, a lot of you in here, everyone in here actually is in her prayers every single night. Because either she's mentioning people specifically from church, or she's saying, pray for my church family. Um, so every night she does that. And so I'll pray with her. And I'll pray for everyone she wants to pray for. I'll pray for her dogs and cats and her baby dolls, because she's three. And, and I'll pray for her. And I'll pray for her mommy. And I'll pray for baby Shepherd. I'll say amen, I'll kiss them on the head, and I'll walk away. You know who I never pray for? I never pray for myself. Now, pride kicking in again. I always thought it's just because I care about other people. No, it's because I expect myself to handle everything myself. Pride has kicked in. And I think if we were all honest with ourselves, we would admit we do the same things. When we are facing something and we are dealing with something, we'll think we have to face it alone, that we can't even ask God for help. And what we're doing is we're leading to a life of stress and anxiety and burnout. Because you were never meant to carry the burdens of this life alone. And so today, I'm going to be talking about prayer. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about how to pray. And talking a little bit about how we pray. Somewhat how we have prayer wrong. And why we pray. And what to expect when we pray. So first, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with something because I think there's a misconception about prayer. So my first point is actually, if you're taking notes, how do we pray? Because I ask youth all the time. We do this in my small group. I have the high school guys in my small group, and I'm like, hey, who wants to pray? And it's a staring contest. And you know what my number one response is? <laughs> I don't know how to pray. I'm like, bro, you just had a conversation with me. You know how to pray. See, because we assume. That our prayers have to be this giant theological, like we have to establish our giant vocabulary for God because uh, we can impress him with what we say. Can I tell you that our God spoke light into existence? When his words left his mouth, physical beings formed out of the ground, right? The, The trees, the stars, the waters, they formed under his voice. Can I tell you your deep theological vocabulary is not going to impress him? It doesn't. Oh, Father God, Yahweh, Jehovah, Jireh, it doesn't matter how many of those you say. He cares more about what's in your heart. He cares about what's in your heart. Prayer is not a mystery, it's a conversation. Prayer is simply this. Hey, God, today was kind of tough. That's prayer. You can do it sitting down, you can do it standing up, eyes closed, eyes open, however you want. It is a conversation with God. You've talked to your best friend before, it's the same thing. It doesn't have to be any fancier than your last conversation because God is there and he is open and he wants you to talk to him. He wants you to pursue him and he wants you to give things up to him, right? And, and for a lot of us, this is a, a breakthrough. We have to, we have to beat, we have to, to break through and, and ask for help and, and understand that when we actually open our mouths, God is listening and God isn't too busy for you and me, that maybe no one else is willing to listen to you, but he is. That maybe no one else wants to hear about your problems, but he does. And no one else wants to help and support you and be there when you need them, but he does. And he will be. If we lift our prayers up to him. And so the next point is, why do we pray? Why do we pray? Now, this is a question I've heard a lot. Is God is, fancy word, omnipotent, means all-powerful. He knows all things. He is in all places. He's omnipresent, a whole bunch of fancy words. All that means is he's everywhere at all times. He knows all things at all times. 
So what in the world is the use of prayer if God already knows? Who says prayer is for God? God already knows what you need. I think prayer is a reminder to us where we need to place our faith. That is a reminder to us to where we take our struggles, where we take our problems. It's a reminder to us to ask our Heavenly Father for help where we need it and that we're not running off and trying to handle everything ourselves. Because like, a lot of times, we, we do like what I call drive-by prayers, right? God, I need help. God, will you fix that? Like imagine for a moment, if, uh, if I had a broken window and and, and I called Lucas over to help me fix my window because he's, he's a lot handier than I am. And, and, but immediately, he's like, yeah, I'm on my way. And then immediately after hanging up, I call a repairman and have him come fix my window. Have I put any faith at all in Lucas? None. But why do we do that to God? We're like, God, I really need your help in this area of my life. And as soon as we hang up, we're calling someone else to try to fix it. That's not faith. That's doing, speaking words into the universe without any expectation that God's actually going to show up. So we pray to invite God into our situations. We pray to remind ourselves where our faith is placed. We pray because pray, prayer is the power. Prayer is our connection to God. Uh, for example, I'll tell this story again because I thought it was funny. I walked out those doors this morning. And Jacob was out there turning on that computer. Shameless plug, if you ever want to know what's going on at this church, it's on that little computer right outside that door. Uh, Jacob was turning on that computer, and I walked out there, and he's fumbling with the computer. And then he says, it's not plugged in. And I'm like, yeah, things work better when they're plugged in, Jacob. <laughs> but but it, it immediately connected to me. Prayer is us plugging into God. That without prayer, without our connection to God, we are powerless. Without our connection to God, we don't work, right? And, and I had a cool idea for an illustration. Jessica helped me uh, critique it just a little bit. I'm going to bump this out a little bit. So I have a bucket here. I had originally had the idea, it'd be cool if I could start a fire. She said I shouldn't do that, and I thought she was smart, so I'll go with that. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. We're imagining this bucket is fire. Can you just go with me? Uh, fire is just sort of our umbrella. We're going to put the stresses and the worries, the anxiety, the depressions, the, the struggles of life, we're going to put in this bucket that we're calling fire. And I don't want to call it fire because I think fire is a great representation because fire, it consumes and destroys everything it touches. And our, our problems and our struggles with left unmanaged will destroy everything they touch. And so often, this is how we fight the fires in our life. This is us, by the way. This is a, this is a water hose, in case you needed that sort of information. Okay? This is a water hose. This is how we fight a lot of our fires. Hey, we can sit here and do this all day, but this is what our power looks like. A lot of times we try to fight our fires with ourselves, within ourselves. And, and we try to rely on our own power. But the problem is, like if I, you guys are not afraid right now at all, at all. You're not, because there's no power in this hose, right? There, this, this hose does nothing by itself. This is simply a, a really long jump rope, right? Like, I mean, it, at this point, it's nothing. You see, the difference comes when you actually take the hose and you connect it to its source of power, right? I think it's kind of great, because when we connect to our source of power, the way we do it is we hit our knees, right? We hit our knees and, and bow in reverence to God, What's interesting is that when we connect to our source of power, the same as how this hose connects to its source of power, something starts to change. There's a power there that wasn't before. Things start to change as it's, you begin to get filled up, as you begin to get full. You have a power. You have a presence about you that you didn't have before. And all of a sudden, things are different. Now, if I do this, you guys are a little more panicked. Now, y'all know I'll get fired if I spray you, so we're not going to do that. But now this hose has something behind it. It has a power. You know why? Because it's connected to its power source. It's connected to the source of its power. Now this hose, which was once just a silly jump rope, is now actually a vessel for putting out the fires in your life. And a lot of times we're sitting here trying to fight the fires of our life with our own power. 
and our own power is, is futile. It's fallible. It'll run out. It'll empty itself. But when we are connected to our power source... We have unlimited power because we are connected to the Holy Spirit of God. And that we can keep going and going because we are connected to the power. And prayer is what we use to connect with God. Now, the the common problem is that we go to God when there is a fire. We go to God when we need Him, right? And so once the the fire has been put out, we uh, just immediately disconnect. And we start to go on our own way because we start to convince ourselves that we put out that fire, that we were strong enough, that we had the power inside ourselves. And so when things start to come up again, we start to still put them out, right? And we still have the power. But something starts to change when we begin to put put out things, when we begin to establish our own power, is it starts to lose pressure, right? It starts to lose its ability, And it gets weaker and weaker by the day. You see, you can connect to God, and you can put out some fires, and you can feel the strength of God, but eventually that power will run out because the power is not in a one-time relationship with God. It's in persistent commitment to God. It's in going to God day in, day out. It's continuously plugging. Even when there's no fires to be seen, we still go to God. But a lot of times we convince ourselves that it was our own power And then when another fire rises and we go to try to put it out, we start to ask, God, where are you? Why did you leave me? You were there when I got saved. You were there when I was in church. But where are you now? Which brings us to our first parable. The first parable is called the parable of the persistent widow. It's in Luke 18. And it goes like this. One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Well, Luke stole the punchline there. Told it at the beginning. All right, verse 2. There was a judge in a certain city. He said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. Men, don't say anything. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Don't say anything. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision to the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will will he find on the earth who have faith? See, in this parable, what we have is an emphasis on persistent prayer. And I think there's a power here in persistent prayer. So I think the first step to overcoming the fires of life is to pray with persistence. Now, we have to understand something, because earlier in Scripture, Jesus actually says, um, don't, be, don't be like the, I believe it's the Pharisees, but he says, don't be like them, for they utter words, they think that they'll get praised by their many words. Now, that's different than what we're talking about here. We're talking about praying day and night praying with persistence, constantly lifting our prayers to God, constantly plugging back into God. It's not that we think God will honor us because of our many words. It's a, a constant reminder to where we're putting our faith, and it's, it's constantly plugging back in to our power source. Because if we are not plugged back in, our power will eventually run dry, and we'll feel like the grace of God is not there. And when a fire comes up, we'll be unable to put it out because we've unplugged from our source. Persistent prayer is this, that we plug in to God day and night. And when we have a need and we have a fire that needs to put out, we bring it before God day and night. We bring it before God every single day. And that we create a, a prayer life, right? It's actually us engaging in prayer, talking to God every single day, so that we will continuously be plugged in to our power source. Just like this hose, right now, it's not plugged in, or it's it's disconnected from its power source. We need to stay plugged in every single day. And so I have a challenge. If you ask my youth, I like challenges. 
I have a challenge for everyone here. I'm going to call it the Thirsty 30 Challenge, because it sounds cool, and I was doing something with water. So the Thirsty 30 Challenge. The idea behind it, and I heard this uh, from someone else, but I, but I love it, and I really think it's life-changing if we can implement it every single day. So my challenge is this. For the next 30 days, we're going to do the Thirsty 30 Challenge. So if you don't write anything else down, I want you to write this down so that we can go and do this and see what it does in your life. But the idea is this, is that you and I have an appetite. Very clearly, I have an appetite, right? But, but even more than that, we have a need for water, right? We can eat, but we can eat far less than we can drink. But you and I, we need water every single day, every day. Your body needs water to survive, right? But our spirit needs God every single day. I would say our spirit needs God more than our body needs water. The problem is, most Christians in America, and I know it's not us, but most Christians in America drink of that spiritual water once a week. What would your body look like if you drank of physical water once a week? The thing is, we've got to be thirsty for God because a lot of people, a lot of Christians are dying spiritually because they've simply not been engaging in a life with God, a life with Jesus. They go to church, they think, okay, I'm good, I got filled up, and they, they think that'll last until next Sunday. It won't. Life will happen and life will dehydrate you. So my challenge for each and every person here is to take this challenge, the Thirsty 30 Challenge. And it's just, it's pretty simple, there's no plan, there's no tracking it, it you, you just do it, okay? So it's this, you start off with, spend 30 minutes in prayer each day. Each day, or gosh, spend 10 minutes in prayer each day. Wow, that would have been excessive. <laughs> Truly not, but but we start off with 10 minutes in prayer to God each day. And again, this doesn't have to be fancy. You're like, I can't think of that many names for God to spend 10 minutes. You know how many times I'm going to say just? Just a bunch, okay? And and 10 minutes. (laughs) That's so dumb. Just 10 minutes with God each day. (laughs) The next is that we spend 10 minutes in the Word of God each day. You know, more often than not, God speaks to me through his word. At the end, I'm going to share a passage that seems to have nothing to do with this, but God spoke to me through it, and I'm going to share it. More often than not, God speaks to me through scripture than in any other way. So what would God say to you if you would spend just 10 minutes a day in the word, in, in, in your Bible? Start in John, read 10 minutes. And the last is that we spend 10 minutes in worship to God each day. And this is, this is throwing in the AirPods, turning on some worship, some praise and worship. All right, I like, like Christian rap too, guys, but let's, for this, we're talking some Chris Tomlin, some elevation, right? We want, we want worship music because we want to, to, to raise God up and we want to praise and worship God and, and, and listen to words and sing a praise and worship to God. If we could do this, if we could spend 30, you know we get 24 hours in a day. God gave that to us, 24 hours. I'm talking about spending half of one of those giving it to God. Each and every one of us could do this, and I bet at the end of 30 days, each and every one of us would be changed if we would put this kind of commitment to God. And can I tell you guys, devotion doesn't start with devotion, it starts with discipline. Discipline. It may feel unnatural, but by the end of the 30 days, I bet your day won't feel complete until you spent 30 minutes with God. And this is, this is where we start, but my, my hope and prayer is that it grows from there. But I believe that if we could take the, the Thirsty 30 Challenge that it could be life-changing. I truly do. But for many of us, I think this would be a test of humility. Because taking a challenge like this is actually admitting that we can't do it all on our own. All on our own. Those were words. It's admitting that we can't do it all on our own. Which kind of reminds me of someone that Jesus talks about in this next parable. So starting in Luke uh, 18, verse 9. It says, then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Chenner, uh, Chenner's, good goodness. Words, man. <laughs> Cheaters, sinners, and adulterers, I'm certainly not like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. 
But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest saying, O God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, just for a moment, I want to take off our New Testament glasses. Because we've all read the New Testament, and we've, we've started to get uh, the misconception that when we read the word Pharisee, we're talking about a villain. And when we read the word tax collector, we're talking about a misunderstood victim. Uh, because Jesus was very countercultural, and a lot of times that established his message the way that he wanted to. But I want to I break down what this would actually have been in, in first century Jerusalem. So we think of Pharisee, and we typically think of a hypocrite. And, and a lot of times we'd be right, but guys, we're all hypocrites, okay? So let's, let's take that off for just a second. When we're talking about Pharisee, we're talking about their pastors, we're talking about their religious leaders. We're talking about the, the little old man in the Southern Baptist Church that you look up to and think he's just an amazing dude. Like, that's who we're talking about. We're talking about missionaries here. We're talking, like, think of the, the, one of the best people you could imagine right now in your faith, and that's who we're talking about. Now, with the tax collector, we're talking the complete opposite end of the spectrum. We're talking about the IRS teamed up with the mafia, and they're stealing all of your money, right? Right? The tax collectors, they were actually hired by Rome to collect the taxes of the, the other Jews, and then they could take however much money they wanted. Rome wanted their piece, and then they could have all the rest, and they would literally rob their people blind. They were not good people. Actually, they weren't even classified in with sinners. Whenever the Pharisees would say something about Jesus who he's eating with, they would say he's eating with sinners and tax collectors. Right? They are so bad, they don't even fit in the sinner category. Even here, this Pharisee, Jesus says that this Pharisee says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, even chinners, sinners, adulterers, and I'm certainly not like this tax collector. Are you telling me tax collectors are worse than cheaters, sinners, and adulterers? That's pretty bad. All right, so that's the culture we're talking about. The worst of the worst. The best of the best. And Jesus does this on purpose because he wants to start with this presupposition that you have the best of the best and the worst of the worst, and they walk into a temple. You would think that the Pharisee walking in would automatically be honored by default, that his prayer would be heard because of how good he is. But no, Jesus shoots that down and he says, No. Because what's the Pharisee says? He comes in and he's like, thank God I'm not like other people. I'm glad you made me so good, right? That's not a prayer. That's like a bad autobiography. He comes in, he doesn't even say a prayer. It's not heard. But the tax collector, he comes in and he humbles himself before God. And he says, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. So the next step is to pray with humility. Pray with humility. And we, we may think, a lot of us in are like, at least I'm not like that tax collector, or at least I'm not like that Pharisee, right? But we've just fallen in the same trap the Pharisee did. A lot of times we'll pray selfish prayers. A prayer that might sound like, God, I've been, I've been trying really hard. I've been working really, really hard, and I haven't cussed. I got cut off in traffic, and I was, I was a good Christian boy, and so if you could just, you know, hook me up, that's a self-reliant prayer. Or, God, if you could just do this for me, I will, I will attend church every Sunday this week. And that's a self-reliant prayer. You see, our prayers may not sound like the Pharisees, but a lot of times we think God's going to honor us because how good we've been. But God says to come to him with humility. God, I am a sinner. I am broken. And you know what's powerful about that? Is now you know when God blesses you, you had nothing to do with it. It wasn't because you were good enough. It wasn't because you achieved enough. It wasn't because you were cool enough or popular enough. You had the right amount of friends. You did good in your football game or your test. Not yet. God blessed you because he loves you. Nothing you could do could get you there. Nothing. So we pray with humility. The third thing we do is we pray with devotion. Pray with devotion. And all I mean here is that we actually lift our prayers to God. That we look at the face of God when we pray. Right? I, I don't know about you guys. I might be the only one that does this. But sometimes I'm guilty when I pray before a meal. I'm just trying to eat. 
No? No one else? Okay. No, that cracker barrel, good, though. You don't want to wait. Sometimes whenever I pray at night, I'm just trying to get words out so I can go to sleep. Sometimes when I'm asked to pray, I just go on autopilot and say the same things every single time. That's not praying with devotion. When I'm saying pray with devotion, you actually open your mouth and you speak to God Almighty. That you speak to the presence of God. That it is not an uttered prayer. It is not an a automatic prayer. But you pour out your heart and your soul to God. Even if it looks like, God have mercy on me. I am a sinner. That is you praying with devotion and lifting your prayers to the God Almighty. So we pray with devotion. And, I, and I'm, I'm about to start to close. About to start to close. Isn't that a preacher thing to say? All right. So I'm going to end with this. What happens when we pray? What happens when we pray? I'm going to read a passage of scripture. I'm going to have Sam come up and help me uh, after the passage. This is what I was talking about, that, I, that God speaks to me through his word more than anything else. I was reading in Matthew 14. It's a passage I've read numerous times. You've probably heard it preached a dozen or more times. But something's jumped out to me that I don't think I'd ever noticed before. So I'm going to start verse 22. Immediately after this, the after this is God, uh, Jesus fed the 5,000. So immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting the heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. Something jumped out to me, and I, I don't know if this is true, but I wonder if something was revealed to Jesus in his prayer that he knew his disciples were in trouble. Why else would he have came at three o'clock in the morning and not just wait till dawn? When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come, on, come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. And that, just, that to me sounded like the prayer of the tax collector. Save me, Lord. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. He says, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. When, then the disciples worshipped him. They said, you really are the Son of God. All right, Sam, if you want to come on up. I want to, I want to illustrate this. The best way I can figure out how to illustrate what jumped out to me. Because I've, I've, heard, this, I've heard this parable. I've read this parable. I've preached this parable numerous times. And I think the message I've always gotten out of it was this. Wow, Peter's the only other human to ever walk on water. Or the only human, I guess, to walk on water. Or, Peter, dummy, you're on the water. Look to Jesus. Something else jumped on me. I'm going to have you play Peter because I have the microphone. I'll be Jesus. All right. So you hop over there in your boat. I'll have the beard. All right. So I want to illustrate real quick what happened. So step out of the boat. Peter steps out of the boat. Okay, walk toward me, walk toward me, walk toward me. Wind and waves, wind and waves, drown, 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 drown. Okay, very good. I'll grab you, grab you, come on. All right, why'd you doubt? Why'd you doubt? Okay. Now something really cool happens. I want to do it one more time just because I thought it was really funny. Do it again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right, Peter steps out of the boat. Boom. He starts to walk toward Jesus. He looks away. Wind and waves, wind and waves. Drown, 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 drown. Okay, good. Got you, got you. Why did you doubt? Now, something really cool happens right here, right here. It actually says in verse 32, walk on over with me, Peter. When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. So based on what the Bible does not tell us, we have to assume this is what happens. Step back in the boat. High step, high step, high step. Thank you. You can go back to your seat. <laughs> you're, you're, you're in the boat. Row your boat home. Based on what Scripture does not tell us, we have to assume... Peter drowned. Jesus grabs him. He says, why did you doubt? They begin to walk back to the boat, both of them on the water, because it says they climbed into the boat together. And then, once they were in the boat, the wind stopped. Oftentimes when we pray, we pray that God will change the storm. But what Jesus did is he came to walk through the storm with you. He didn't, he didn't put out the storm. 
He walked Peter back to the boat through the storm. See, a lot of our prayers, they're, they're, God, change this situation. Take this thing away from me. It's too much for me to bear. But Isaiah 43, my favorite scripture in all of the Bible, it says this, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. Oh, how it, well, I wish it said, when you walk around the water, or, or when you pa- pass over the river, when you walk around the fire, no, Jesus right here, the, the Bible is telling us that you will go through some hard waters, that you will go through some fires of life. But guess what? When you lift God up in prayer, he is there with you. And you are not going through it alone. And when, they, when the waters come, they will not sweep over you. And when the fire comes, you will not be burned. Why? Because your God and Savior is with you. Now, sometimes, sometimes God changes the situations. And I, I can't, I'm not smart enough to tell you what those times are or why he changes the situation, sometimes why he doesn't. But all I can tell you is sometimes the situation changes, but all the time your God is with you. All the time your God is with you. You notice Peter and Jesus walked back through the storm to the boat. But a lot of times, when you're in the midst of your storm, it's hectic. It's crazy. There's winds and there's waves and there's lightning. And a lot of times, in the midst of your storm, you can't see the hand of God. A lot of times, all you can see is the problem before you. And you assume at that moment your God has left you, that you've been left all alone, stranded to handle it on your own. I know in my personal times, in my personal times of loss, when I expected God to show up, when I expected God to change the situation, and he didn't, I felt lost and confused. I thought, I prayed up prideful prayers where I'm like, God, I've been so good. God, I have preached for you. God, I've led others to you. I've left the country to teach people about you. Why are you letting me go through this? And it's when I got to the other side that I could see his hand on me, that he was saying, child, I know it's hard, but I'll be with you, that I will walk with you step by step. I will weep with you. I will pray with you, and I will be with you. And so often we expect the storms to change, but God is just trying to walk with us through it. And I don't know what you're facing. And I know each and every person in here is is facing a struggle, is facing something, life that's just how it is. And it feels like too much. But scripture tells us that when we go through the waters, when we go through the rivers, we go through the fire, that he will be with us. My prayer is that whatever you're facing, that you'll continue to connect to your power source that you would rely on the strength of God, that you would know whatever the storm is, whatever the weight is, you don't have to bear it alone. But your God is with you, and he's walking with you step by step, and he wants you to lean on him. He says his yoke is easy. He says his burden is light, and he wants to help you through whatever the storm is you're facing. And so my prayer is that each and every person would learn to rely on God, to lean on him, to move into relationship further and deeper with him every single day so that whatever you're facing, you don't have to do it alone. And that you can know, even when you can't see his hand, it is there. Even when you can't feel his presence, he is always there. Even when you, can't, you don't know and it doesn't seem like your prayers are being answered, that he is there. And when you make it into the boat, you'll see his footsteps and that he was there carrying you the whole time. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. God, we come to you today not in our goodness, but in yours. God, you are so great and you are so good that you tore the veil and let us come directly to you. God, I pray for anyone here today that's in the midst of a storm, that's in the midst of a fight and a struggle, that they would know they're not in it alone, that you are their God and you love them. You laid down your life for them. You are the God that overcomes every obstacle. He that is in the world is not greater than you. 
God, you are amazing and you are with each and every one of us. We don't have to face the storms and the trials of life alone, but you are here with us. God, I pray that you would speak to each and every person, that your Holy Spirit would leave here with each and every person, that the strength and confidence that you offer would be in each and every person. God, we need you. We can't do it alone. We need you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.